It is now my privilege to present to you the senior from the class of 2019 who is graduating with the highest grade point average today, Rachel Gail Berkey. It has been the tradition for some time that the senior with the highest GPA serve as the person introducing our guest speaker. And Rachel, we invite you to come and introduce Dr. Brunson to us at this time. Thank you, Dr. Hellams. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you our speaker for the day, Dr. Angie Brunson. Angie Craig Brunson was born in 1968, the first of seven children. He graduated from Ben Limpin School and later earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Wheaton College in 1988. He married Noreen Lynn Steiner in 1989, and they are the parents of three adult children, Jordan, Jacqueline, and Blaze. Following his marriage, he earned a Master's of Arts degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in 1991, a Master of Divinity degree from Erskine Theological Seminary in 1992, and a Doctor of Phys Psychology degree from the University of Aberdeen in 2001. Andrew and Noreen Brunson served as ARP missionaries with World Witness from 1993 to 2010, where he taught seminary classes and started outreaches in several cities. On October 7, 2016, Andrew and Noreen Brunson were detained in Izmir, and the family's public and private ordeal began. While his wife Noreen was released on October 19, Andrew Brunson remained captive for more than two months before being falsely charged with membership in an armed terrorist organization and sent to prison. In prison, he struggled with fear and loneliness, yet he realized as he wrote a letter to his family that he was in the position of being a living martyr and that he had been given a responsibility and opportunity to suffer publicly for Jesus. In the face of mounting pressure from the United States government and other quarters for his release, Andrew Brunson was transferred to house arrest on July 25, 2018. At his fourth hearing on October 12, 2018, the house arrest and travel ban were lifted, a conviction was issued, and a sentence was imposed. He was released on the basis of time served. Andrew and Noreen Brunson left Turkey later that same day. Since then, they have been recuperating in North Carolina at their home church, Christ Community Church of Montreal. Erson College is honored this fourth day in May to hear from a pastor and missionary who has persevered in faith and encouraged believers by his example of Christian witness, endurance, and trust in God. Dr. Brunson, we welcome you to Erson College and Seminary. Happy to be here on this special day. I graduated from Erskine in 1992. Yes, Dr. King was one of my teachers. He was not only my teacher, he was my father's teacher back sometime in the 60s. I'm probably the only convicted terrorist in this group. <laughs> and you wonder what Dr. King had to do with it. <laughs> um, I am happy to be here and I'm I'm here because I want to honor the ARP Church. I'm grateful for the inheritance I received from the ARP Church. Uh, my parents were missionaries in the ARP, but it's not only the church of my fathers, of my father, it's uh, many of my uh, relatives and ancestors uh, were in the ARP Church, and I received a great inheritance because of that uh, love for scripture, uh, teaching uh, that really shaped my life, and I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for the many ARPs who prayed for me. I see Lee Shelnut here, and while he was moderator of the Synod, uh, he approved a day or called for a day of fasting and prayer. I'm very grateful for this. Uh, it was a wave of prayer that brought me out of Turkey. I desperately needed that prayer. I was having a very difficult time in prison. Uh, but that prayer did not only bring me out, I think that it was God was raising up a movement of prayer around the world uh, that I was just a catalyst for it, but he was doing something much greater than just bringing me out. He's using that prayer to transform that country and that region. So you were part of something uh, very big that God was doing, and I'm grateful for you standing with me. I've been thinking over the last few days about what I wanted to share with you and uh, what is really a burden on my heart, an urgency, is that I believe that it is going to become increasingly difficult to stand for Jesus and for truth in the United States. And my generation faced challenges. 
I think yours is going to face even more. It is facing even more and more hostile environment to Jesus in this country uh, than I did when I was coming out at your age. So one of the great challenges for this generation, for your generation, is going to speak truth. And I don't mean by this, my truth. I think many people talk about my truth nowadays, or your truth. It means simply this, to say about everything what God says about it. And this is where you're going to be challenged. First, to speak God's character. For example, saying that he is good, that he is true no matter what uh, circumstances say. And I was tested with this in prison. Sorry, this is my notes are flying all over. One of you is not getting a diploma today. <laughs> so are you going to say about God's character, what he says about it, that he is good in all circumstances? I was tested with this in prison. And if our nation continues to go down the path that it is on now, then God will bring discipline and judgment, I believe. And this is going to cause offense uh, in many people, offense towards God and offense towards his people. Will you say about God that he is good, that he is just, that he is true in all that he does in those circumstances when there's a hostile environment? Along with talking, saying the truth about God's character, it's saying about everything what God says about it. And this is especially important in the areas of holiness and morality. And this is where you will face the immediate challenge to stand for God. There's a spiritual battle going on behind many of the issues of our day. Who's going to define truth? Who will define morality? Who will define identity? And if you stand for Jesus, then there's a growing likelihood that society will marginalize you, look down on you. Maybe it will mean a loss of prestige, losing your job, and maybe worse. Persecution is coming, and I'm really sorry to tell you this on your graduation day, uh, but there's good news, and the good news is that, is that God wins in the end. And so does everyone who's with him, everyone who stands on his side, everyone who sticks with him. But my deep concern is that we're not ready for it, that your generation is not prepared for what you will face. And we need to be prepared to stand for God in difficult circumstances. To do that, you have to have the right mindset, the right perspective, the right expectations. And I know about this. It's a great danger not to be prepared. Uh, I, I know about it because I wasn't prepared for prison. I had a very difficult time. I broke many times. And one of the reasons I struggled so much in prison, and there, there are a number of factors involved in this that I can't go into, but one of them is that I didn't have the right mentality. I, I, was not, I was prepared for some things. I counted the cost. We had many threats over our time in Turkey. If you want to be popular, then you don't try to start churches in a Muslim country. So we were not popular. I was shot at once. Uh, we, I had many threats over the years. My, my family did. We worked with refugees uh, near a war zone. So I, I thought I was relatively seasoned and tough in some ways. But prison was beyond me. I hadn't counted the cost of this. So I was surprised. And I did make it through, but I would have struggled less if I'd been better prepared. So Jesus warns that persecution will come and that we need to prepare ourselves and have the right mindset about it. And he warns that those who are not prepared will have a difficult time and many will end up failing. And I'm not saying this, Jesus said this. And he especially talked about four areas. That One of them is that people will become fearful when there's opposition. And if we respond from fear, then the tendency is not to stand in difficulty, it's to run away. I often wanted to run away in prison. And I, I thank God that, that he didn't give me the opportunity to. That he, put, he allowed me to be uh, uh, arrested and I couldn't escape because there are things he wanted to do in my life and also through your prayers in Turkey that would not have been accomplished if I had run away. But many will run away when there's opposition if we respond in fear. Many will be deceived because to avoid pressure, they will compromise Many will be offended at God because he doesn't intervene and save us always. There's no guarantee when it comes to persecution what the outcome will be. And many, Jesus said, will turn to immorality and drunkenness. Why? Because this is a way to escape difficulty and pressure. So we need the right mindset. But beyond this, we need to have hearts that are devoted to God. And this is what I really want to emphasize today. The only way you can maintain the perseverance and the courage necessary 
to stand for God in difficult times is by focusing on loving God. This was the message of Jesus to the church at Ephesus. If you want to read it later, Revelation chapter 2, and this side of Ephesus was just an hour away from our home in Turkey. And Jesus had nothing to criticize about the church in Ephesus. He said a lot of good things about them. He says they were, they were devoted to truth. But he did say something that was very sobering. He said, you are, you're doing everything right. But you're except that your first love has become cold. So they had a commitment to truth, but they were missing the heart of Jesus. And this should be sobering to us, especially because uh, in the ARP church, we, we tend to focus on doctrine, and the Presbyterians really focus on doctrine, on theology and right belief, and this is very important. But the heart is actually even more fundamental, and it's more elusive. And Jesus said that the most important thing, the fundamental, foundational thing is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love Him with all that you are. And this is what will make you willing to pay the price and to persevere in difficult times. In 2007, I started to run after God in a new way. I wanted more intimacy with Him. I wanted to taste His presence And at that time, I'd been a missionary for 14 years. We'd already been working in church planting, started a couple of churches. I had a PhD, this theological training. And and yet I felt a real need in my heart, in my life, for more of God. And I started looking for more. And as I did, as I ran after God and tried to cultivate that devotion for him, this changed my ministry, and God actually gave me more. Everything in our lives, for those going into ministry from the seminary, but for college graduates, everything in our lives, relationships, how we do our jobs, if the relationship with God is right in your life, if your relationship with God is right, everything else will fall into place. Everything else flows from that vertical relationship. So I had run after God's presence for years. I tasted his presence. I was focused on intimacy with God. But prison tested my love for God. The question was, would I survive prison? Not just physically, but would my, would my heart survive it? And my love for God was tested. And at one point, I broke very badly. I was suicidal. And I read something that sobered me up about the valley of testing. Every one of you is going to be tested in life. And many are tested and they don't make it. They don't pass the test. They may end up going to heaven, but they miss out on becoming what God wanted them to be. And they end up having a life with no fruit. And the valley of testing is full of skeletons. It's full of dry bones of those who have failed. And I started to plead with God, I don't want to fail in the valley of testing. Shortly after that, I was transferred from a high security prison to a maximum security prison called Buja. On the road to Buja, I'm in a, in a prison, a large prison van, in a plastic bubble, so I'm isolated, and I'm surrounded by soldiers with submachine guns and, and handcuffs. And as we were, we, to get to Buja prison, we had to drive through Izmir, which is a city that I'd been living in for, for many years. And we re- reached there around rush hour, and the streets were, the roads were crowded with, with cars. All of these people going back to their homes after work. And this was my home as well. (laughs) I was so close to where Noreen was, and yet I was so far away from her, and this thought stabbed me. I was so far from home, so powerless to get there. My wife, my children had never felt so distant. And then a ray of light broke through in my grief. I looked at a man, I looked out through these scratched, reinforced glass of the prison vehicle, And I saw a man sliding past in a white VW Golf. That's a car. (laughs) He was totally oblivious to my presence. Like everyone else on the road, he was driving home to his family. And ahead of him lay years of freedom. Ahead of me lay Buja prison. And I didn't know if I'd ever be free again to be with my family. But while I knew nothing about his story, I knew something about mine. I knew Jesus. I knew that I might be a prisoner then, but I had the promise of eternal life, the guarantee of ultimate freedom. 
My life had meaning, my life was not empty, and my suffering was not the end of my story. And it hit me, of all the people on that road, I was likely the only one who had a relationship with Jesus Christ. I was the only one who knew for sure where I would go after I die. And it was a clarifying moment about what really matters in life. Some of you here may not be believers. Some of you may be no closer to Jesus than the Muslims on that crowded road in Turkey. I don't assume that just because you're graduating from Erskine College that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe, I hope this will be a clarifying moment for you then about what is most important in life. After I arrived at Buja prison, I made a decision. I couldn't do much to gain my freedom. I'd been trying for a year and <laughs> nothing was happening, but I could fight for my spiritual life because if I didn't survive spiritually, if I did not keep my heart pointed towards God, turned towards God, if I didn't hold on to my faith and my relationship with him, then everything would be lost. And I determined that I would pursue God even in my weakness, even in my doubts, even with my questions and my brokenness. And this marked a turning point for me. There's nothing more important than loving God. This includes feelings, the love for Him, but it's much more than this. It's devotion, it's obedience, it is a pursuit of God. And it doesn't happen automatically. When I was younger, I was sure that by the time I was an old man in my 50s, which I've reached that now, that I would be super spiritual. I'd be deeply in love with God because I'd be older, and of course that would have happened to me. Well, I do love God, but it didn't happen automatically. Many start out devoted to God, pursuing Him, but very few pursue Him long term. Some of my close friends are no longer walking with God. Some of them who are walking with God don't have a passion for him. And seminary grads, I'd especially say to you, it's very likely that a number of you will drop out of ministry because of burnout, spiritual burnout. If you don't keep your relationship with God fresh, if you don't pursue him, you can be a casualty. I had to pursue. And the thing is, I keep sliding. Now I've been through two years of difficulty. I've stood for Jesus publicly, but I can still slide away from him. The love can still grow stale and cold. And that because this is our natural tendency, we naturally decrease in love and it has to be nurtured. I have to continue to renew this. When I was in prison, I was desperate for God in a way I was forced to. I'm glad to have escaped prison. And yet there's actually something I miss from that terrible ordeal. The conditions of imprisonment, the, the isolation, the threats, the fears, it drove me to cling to God as never before in my life. Those things also brought a rare clarity about what really matters. And my every day in prison became consumed with seeking God and drawing close to Him. And now I'm free and I'm very grateful for my freedom. But I miss being so completely dependent on God. And I want to recapture that desperate seeking I had then. I graduated from college in 1988. Our commencement speaker was a man named Chuck Colson. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was one of the very influential Christian leaders of his generation. And it was an honor to have him speak at our commencement. But I don't remember a word he said. I'm sure it was very good and it was very important. But I was thinking about other things as you are today. I don't remember what he said, but I do remember what he stood for. It was his life more than his words that affected me. So I wasn't invited to speak today because I graduated from Erskine Seminary or because I'm a great speaker. It's because of what I went through, because of what I endured and came to represent. And I expect that very few of you will remember anything that I say today. But I hope that what I stand for will remain with you. 
I think one of the reasons I went through prison was to be made an example. I did not choose to go to prison. God chose me for this assignment. And I was broken. I can talk a lot about my weakness. But I moved from weakness to a place where I stood to declare the gospel publicly in a hostile court. I know what it's like to be afraid. I know fear. And I know what it means to stand for God in spite of fear. And I did it because I love God. Insofar as I am known, I want to be known as an unapologetic, unashamed lover of Jesus Christ. Towards the end of my first year in prison, I was called suddenly into a court session where I was charged with attempting to overthrow the Turkish government. It was an automatic three life sentences in solitary confinement with no possibility of parole. And this meant that I would never get out. I'd never be with my wife and children again. And I had been climbing upwards out of brokenness. I had made that decision to pursue God no matter what. But this knocked me down hard. Around two weeks after this, I wrote a song. Just out of my heart, my cry to the Lord. One of the verses says this. I want to be found worthy to stand before you on that day with no regrets from cowardice, things left undone. To hear you say, well done, my faithful friend. Now enter your reward, Jesus, my joy. You are the prize I'm running for. This became my main prayer. I want to live in such a way that I have no regrets when I stand before Jesus. And I sang this every day for the rest of my time in prison. Regrets in heaven. Hold on for two minutes, I'm almost done. Regrets in heaven. Are there regrets in heaven? I think there are. Not that we carry the burden or weight of regrets because there'll be great joy. But when each of us stands before Jesus and he shows us our lives, I think many of us will have regrets because to some he's going to say, you're saved, but you wasted your life. When I stand before Jesus at the end of my life, he's not going to ask, Andrew, how many churches did you plant? How many people admired you? How many people did you speak to? Those things don't impress him. He will evaluate me based on one thing, my heart response to him. This is the standard. This is the measure. Did I love Jesus? But when I say he will evaluate me based on my heart response, I'm not talking only about my feelings towards him. What I think, what I do, what I say, all of this is included. If I love Jesus, then I will be willing to stand for him, even if it costs me. If I love Jesus, I'll obey him, even if it costs me. If I love Jesus, I will serve his purposes. If I love Jesus, I will not be ashamed of him. If I love Jesus, I will pursue him. When I wake up in the morning, I try to start off my day by saying this. The only thing that matters is what you, Jesus, think about me and what you say about me. Nothing else can compare. There's nothing more important. So to be faithful in my generation, to love him, this is what I can do. This is what I must do. And someday you will stand before King Jesus. Do you love God? If you don't, then you can make the decision to start today. If you do already, then you can make the decision to nurture devotion for God every day of your life. However much of God you have, there's always more. What will he think about you? What will he say about you? the day you stand before him? This is the only question that matters. So I call you to a more difficult life. But in doing this, I'm only repeating what Jesus already said. Noreen told me as we went through this terrible ordeal, she said, Andrew, if we go through this the right way, we didn't know how it would end we go through this the right way, in the end, we will have no regrets. And we don't have any regrets. 
even with the hardships of prison, the suffering that our family went through, I can say we have no regrets. If you make Jesus, if you make the pursuit of Jesus the goal of your life, even if you have hardship, you also will have no regrets. I want to finish by praying over you the prayer that I prayed in prison for myself and for my family every day in my second year. Father God, pour out on your sons and daughters. Pour out on us, your sons and daughters, the courage, the strength, the confidence, the perseverance, the endurance, and the steadfastness of Jesus that we may run the race set before us and finish well, purified in the fires of faithful obedience, tested and found worthy of Jesus, the King of glory. May God bless you.